And the point that I'm making is that in everybody's life, at some point, there's a plan B. God is talking to us every step of the way. God is trying to show you something every step of the way. When things seem to be going wrong, that's God's way of, of opening another door. I am convinced that God has been directing me every step of my life. On the Word Network. Welcome to Nicholas Hood III Ministries, a ministry of hope, spiritual inspiration, personal power guided by Christian love. May the power of God's Holy Spirit fall upon you as you sit back and enjoy today's program. I introduce you now to Pastor Nicholas Hood III. Today I want to talk about a reason to live. A reason to live. This is the second in a series of sermons on Elijah. Today from 1 Kings chapter 17, actually 19. And in this chapter, uh, right at the beginning, it tells us that uh, Elijah has gone a day's journey uh, from this uh, Sharif that I was talking about last week. And he's been running, you know, for many days. And uh, he's afraid of Jezebel, afraid of King Ahab, that they're going to kill him. And he finally, he's just worn out. He's just been walking and walking and walking. And uh, he's gone about 40 days. And so Elijah stops under a broom tree. Uh, and, you know, I've been reading about the broom tree. It's uh, on a shorter version, would look like a hedge, might grow to, you know, six or seven feet tall, uh, can be colorful. But Elijah finds himself under a broom tree. And there God provides him again with a cake out of nowhere in a jar of water. And I imagine it's a big jar. Uh, and he is finding sustenance there. And, but Elijah is frustrated. He's afraid. He thinks that he's going to be killed by Jezebel and her husband Ahab. And so he falls down and he prays to God and he says, Lord, take my life. It is enough for I am no better than my ancestors. I'm no better then my, in the King James Version, it would say, I'm no better than my father's. And that's what I want to focus on. To me, uh, I get the impression that Elijah uh, is maybe wanting to commit suicide. Uh, he doesn't have the nerve to kill himself, but he's asking God to take his life because he says that uh, I can't take this anymore. And because I can't take this anymore, I want you, God, to take my life. I don't know who's looking at this program right now who's thought about suicide. I don't know if there's anybody here uh, listening to me right now who can identify with Elijah saying, it is enough. I don't have enough money. I'm sick. I have a cancer. Uh, my, my bones are aching. Uh, my heart is not beating the way that it once did. God, why don't you just take it away? you know, get rid of this life. You know, I was looking at statistics on suicide for in America, for every 100,000 people in America, 14 commit suicide. And I don't know how many more uh, actually uh, try to commit suicide, but they fail. Maybe there's somebody looking at this program right now uh, who's in prison. Maybe there's somebody right now who's listening to the sound of my voice and you can identify with what I'm saying. You can identify with a person who feels like their back is up against the wall. They have little or no options. There's nothing more that they can do with their life. And furthermore, like Elijah, you may actually be judging yourself according to your parents. You know, how well did my father or my mother do at my stage of life? Did they have more money than what I have? Did they have a bigger house? Did they drive a better car? Did they wear better clothes? Uh, am I better than my parents? And, you know, I would encourage you, if that's something, you know, a line of thought that you have, to take it out of your mind. Because every generation is a little different. And what was relevant when my parents were young is a lot different than what it was like when I was younger. 
Uh, I had an opportunity last week to go back to Yale University where I met my wife. She was in her last year of uh, undergrad. I was in my first year of divinity school. And, uh, you know, some of you may have heard this story, but it's a true story. I showed up in New Haven, Connecticut. I went to the Yale Divinity School. I registered for classes in the first hour. The second hour, I walked downtown uh, to buy sheets in, in the, the Macy's department store. I walk into the sheet department of Macy's, and who should be there but my wife? And you got to remember, I just signed up for divinity school. And I started thinking about it, and I said, look what the Lord has brought me. And I said, this must be my blessing. And uh, as I told my children, I said, you know, I met your mother first day of school, second hour. And when I walked out of the sheet department of Macy's, I walked out with a wife. And they said, Dad, did it really happen like that? I said, well, not quite. It took me three years. But while I was there, um, I began to ask, uh, you know, I used to I served for eight years on the Alumno Advisory Council for the Yale Divinity School there in New Haven. And I asked one of my dad's contemporaries who knew my dad in divinity school, I said, what was my dad like as a divinity student? And this guy said, your dad was a dynamo. I said, what do you mean he was a dynamo? And he said, your dad would jump up on the tables in the lunchroom. They call it a refractory. And he would lead everybody in singing songs. And he said, everybody loved your dad and was just enthused about him. And I thought to myself uh, this past week when we were there for the, uh, my wife's 50th reunion, I said, well, I never got on a table counter and sang songs. Uh, that wasn't my history. Uh, but then I started thinking about it. I said, now, I could be like Elijah and say, I'm no better than my father or fathers. I said, but everybody's life is a little different. I didn't stand on tabletop singing songs, but I was the director of the Yale Gospel Choir for two years. Uh, I pastored the black church at Yale, which is a student church run by the divinity students. Um, I pastored that for two years. I said, so uh, in my own way, I made a mark too. Matter of fact, I was telling my, some church members, I said, one of the things that was most gratifying to me during that period, during my wife's uh, 50th reunion was when I went to the Afro, African American Cultural Center, which is where the choir sang and the uh, black church at Yale worship, uh, my picture was the first picture in the Yale Gospel Choir book, going back to 1975. And what's the point that I'm making? The only point I'm making is that I'm no better than my father. But I tell you, uh, for me, uh, I've tried to make my own mark. And I think in life, that's all you can do. So I just want to say this. There may be somebody asking the question, well, how can I live a life that's worthwhile? Uh, what is my reason for living if I'm not healthy? What's my reason for living if I'm in prison? What's my reason for living uh, if I'm poor? And I would just say, never forget that you are God's child. Never forget that God gave you life because God saw purpose in you when you were in your mother's womb. Never forget that God wants you to do something meaningful with your life. Uh, God will set the table, but it is you and I who have to pick up the fork and the knife and to eat it. God uh, has given you and me all the tools that we need. God has given us a mind to think, hands to use, feet to move. God has given us a heart to beat. God has given us everything. And my friends, all you and I have to do is to just pick up the banner and run with it. I want you to stick around for a few minutes because I'm bringing back today uh, Reverend Lawrence Rogers, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this whole business of, you know, feeling suicidal, uh, feeling like you haven't accomplished much in life, and how a person can turn their mental attitude around. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm going to be right back. God bless. This is a new ministry which is just starting. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and His power throughout the world. 
If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free, complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs, entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. I have a special guest today, Reverend Lawrence Rogers, pastor of the historic Second Baptist Church in downtown Detroit. Reverend Rogers, I appreciate you being here today. And uh, what are your thoughts about Elijah saying, it is enough, take away my life? Uh, and a reason for Elijah to live, a reason for you and me to live. What are your thoughts on this? I just want to say, uh, Pastor Hood, thank you so much for inviting me to your platform. And I appreciate your work and I appreciate your voice. I think this is a very important uh, story from uh, 1 Kings 19 that uh, displays the reality of mental health, um, emotional health. We live in a time these days where people are overstretched today. People are working long hours and oftentimes underpaid and um, people are dealing with all sorts of stress. It's a very fast paced demanding world where everything is instant and so people want quick responses to emails and text messages and that just adds to the pressure. People are under a lot of strain these days and with the story of Elijah, when he said that, he said, you know, take my life, he had really just had the biggest success of his life. Exactly, he, exactly. He, you know, he, he just defeated the prophets of Baal or Baal, and he uh, found himself uh, defeating them and brought a lot of people back to Yahweh. I mean, it was a high point in his life, and then, he finds himself being persecuted fiercely by Queen Jezebel and King Ahab, so much so where he has to go on the run. And so some people may know what that feels like, to have a high, and then all of a sudden, you're under a broom tree, which is a small tree which speaks to the state of Elijah, <laughs> you, know, that, you know, how he was feeling to be under such a small uh, tree. But what I find to be interesting about But he's this, also fed under that tree and, he, right. and, and there's water. That's exactly right. And that's what I was about to mention is that what I love about Elijah is that Elijah was willing to be real with God. He was willing to keep it buck with God. Or in the seventh day, he would say he wasn't jiving with God. He told God the truth, uh, that he was in despair. And I think we can learn from that, that when we find ourselves in moments of intense despair, honesty with God is the best policy. And I'm grateful that we have a lot of great tools these days uh, beyond just a broom tree, mm -hmm. such as like if a person needs to find a therapist, they can go on psychologytoday.com and on the right hand corner, click on find a therapist and put on their zip code and find somebody to work with to help them process their mental health situations. But also I find what's interesting is how God answered and responded to um, Elijah. It's the fact that God sent a angel, the Bible says, uh, a, a angel and this uh, angel gave Elijah a cake and water, and then told Elijah that you're gonna need your strength for what comes next. Isn't that something that- And, and that's a, a very strenuous journey. Exactly. Which comes next, 40 days. 40 days. Straight, I with think no of, food. Exactly, I mean, I think about that. I, I, I look at Elijah being under that broom tree, it's Elijah also needing some rest. Uh, and he found himself resting, and the angel kind of confirms it a little bit by saying, you know, hey, get some rest, eat this, get, get this nutrition, and get ready uh, for your next part of your journey, which to me says that um, we have to have rest. Even God rested on the seventh day. I mean, we, we have to rest, and sometimes we're not able to get through what God has next for us because we won't spend time in rest. We have to rest, <clears throat> but also we have to run. There, there are times for when resting and running. You have to keep moving. Yeah, yeah. got to know when to hold them and fold them. Right, <laughs> right. When I was a little boy, my father used to tell me, he "said Nick, sometimes a good run is better than a bad stand." That's right. And I would always come back to my dad and say, "But Dad, why did you think I had a bad stand?" <laughs> <laughs> That's that true. true. But um, uh, Elijah is a fascinating character. Yes. You know, on many, many levels, and. What kind of encouragement would you give to members of your church uh, when they're wondering, does it make sense to keep living? Well, you know, the Hebrews writer says, be careful how you treat strangers because you may have entertained an uh, angel unaware. And, you know, Pastor, I know that you are a wordsmith and you understand your biblical 
etymologies, uh, but the word angel in the original language could mean seraphim, it could mean cherubim, but it could also mean just a herald of God, mm -hmm. a messenger of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we find ourselves in that intense despair, we have forgot to be keen on listening to the messages that God is sending our way. Yes. Right? God sends us messages daily. And sometimes we cannot hear them because we're just so distracted. Reverend Rogers, tell us about your book. Thank you and, so much. Uh, you know, what uh, can we learn from something that you've written in this book that relates to a reason to live? Yes, absolutely. Well, this is my book, uh, Inward Revolution, and it's um, a journey of radical transformation. It, it can be found on Amazon.com or anywhere books are sold. But in this book, you know, it, it really deals with um, a, a mental health, spiritual health, emotional health. You know, I, I believe that believers have got to take care of our mental health. I mean, if if I was walking down the street and I stepped in a hole and fell and broke a bone, uh, I would call a physician to help me with my physical health. Our brains are part of our bodies and our brains have chemical processes. And sometimes we need help to work through how we're feeling and what we're thinking. And my book is about practicing the spiritual disciplines and being able to dive into things such as uh, knowing how to use um, uh, silence and solitude and fasting and prayer um, as tools for emotional regulation, but also good spiritual health. Uh, I have a whole chapter on discernment, uh, being able to hear clearly from the voice of God. I have chapters on submission and simplicity and other uh, aspects of how I can better submit, hear the voice of God, and be well uh, regulated both spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. I'm learning from the contact from people around the country who are donating to this to support this ministry. Some are just writing in. Uh, some are calling in, asking for prayer. But uh, recently, you know, I've had a couple of people who are in prison who have written me. And that's so um, just uh, exciting to me to know that somebody in prison is looking at this show. But I'm just wondering, you know, what encouragement do you think the inmate in jail can get from the Elijah story? And if not just the inmate, we also have a number of senior citizens. We have people of all ages who are looking at this all over the country. Um, where is the encouragement that you see in the Elijah story? Oh, I see so much encouragement. I mean, I see so much encouragement. I, mean, I think one thing to remember about Elijah is that uh, Elijah was on the other side of the law uh, by simply doing what God wanted him to do. He found himself, at, when he was under that broom tree, he found himself as a fugitive. And Elijah was willing to give, you know, he was in despair to the point where he said, God, take my life. I just want to say that uh, to the person who finds himself incarcerated, uh, that when you feel that low, I want you to look for the angels around you. Uh, look for God's messengers. Uh, look for God's messages. Uh, look for those around you. The angel could possibly be this program that somebody's watching in, uh, in prison. Look for those angels around you and grab onto that hope. Uh, all you've got to get to is tomorrow. I would also encourage them to, act, to, u to utilize the resources that their, their prison may offer, such as the, uh, the therapist there, the social workers there, to help you to process any despair or hard feelings you may, you may be going through. What about the senior citizen who's looking at this program who is shut in, uh, maybe they drive, maybe they don't drive, uh, but they don't have the mobility that they once had, uh, they've outlived their children. Um, what encouragement do you think they should get from the Elijah story? Well, I think one thing that we learned from the Elijah story is God was not done with Elijah. You know, we, we don't tell God when God is done with us, right? You think about Abraham, his wife. They were both seniors when Abraham's ministry started. A lot of folks in the Bible were seniors when their ministry started, right? And I just think about that. Um, I would say to a senior from the story of Elijah being under the broom tree uh, that uh, lean on the Lord, um, and we cannot lean on our own understanding. Um, I've never been a senior, but one thing I do know um, about uh, the Bible is, is that uh, uh, God can use any one of us. And it's not a matter of uh, my resources, my age, my ability, my, my skills. It's just a matter that God said, I have more for you to do. 
I just want seniors to know that even in your moments of despair, we wonder, what's my purpose? I want you to think about the story of Elijah, where God came and not only encouraged Elijah, but made him a cake and gave him something to drink and told him, I have work for you to do. And a part of that work, Pastor Hood, was Elijah was supposed to go to Elisha and help to develop a succession plan. So what we can learn, because Elisha was going to uh, uh, take on the task that Elijah had when Elijah finally did retire and move on, what we can learn is that a part of the task is mentoring, discipling, and raising up somebody else uh, to do what we once did. And maybe that brings extra hope to a senior as well, that there may be an Elisha in your life that God's baking that cake and giving you water for uh, so you can have the strength to encourage them to do the work that you started. One of my thoughts in uh, that part of the uh, story in chapter 19 is that it's Elijah who expresses that he's, he's tired. He says, it is enough. Take away my life. He feels like he's done as much as he can do. He can't get beyond Jezebel and Ahab. And you're correct. That's the point where God tells Elijah, it's time for you to appoint a successor. That's right. And I think that there may be somebody looking at this right now uh, who's worn out, beat out, you know, and uh, just feels left out. And if you feel that way, maybe this is the time that God is telling you uh, to help to create a succession plan, just like God told Elijah. That's right. Uh, Pastor Rogers, we're going to, I'm going to have you back one more week. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Elijah and Elijah's story. But we've got to wrap this up today. Again, you have a book entitled Inward Revolution. Yes. It can be found on Amazon. Yes, sir. And uh, I wish you a lot of success with this. Thank you. I also wish you a lot of success in your ministry. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I want you to just sit put. And uh, I just want to say a word of thanks, folks. Uh, we have a number of people who have given support. Uh, I, I received a donation last week from a fellow named Ernest Perry. And uh, I want the audience to pray for him. Put him on your personal prayer list. He's an inmate at the Vienna, Illinois uh, facility. And uh, Brother Perry, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I had a brother who was in prison, uh, you know, for a couple years. And uh, that memory has been etched in my mind. I want to thank uh, a preacher and his wife from Cantillo, uh, California, uh, Michael and Lindsay. Kent Actually, their last name is Cantillo. Uh, and they have a ministry of their own, the Kingdom Agenda Ministries. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. To Delgenia Barber, right here in Detroit, uh, who is giving, repeating, monthly donations to this ministry. Sister Delgenia, I really appreciate you. To Jackie and Laura Moore Wyatt from Southfield, they give continuing support to this ministry, and I thank you. Dr. Adonika Nunu, Renee Turner Bailey, and Attorney Rita White have given major contributions uh, to this ministry. Uh, Deborah McIntosh from Mobile, Alabama, I hope to meet you one day, Mrs. McIntosh, but I thank you for your support. Now, why am I reading these names? I'm reading them because I need your support. Uh, this is a new ministry, and it can only make it with your support. There's a fellow in the Bronx, New York, uh, named Charles Johnson. I thank you. Cynthia Banks, right here in Detroit. Joyce Penn, Huell Perkins, used to be on Channel 2. I thank Brother Huell, Edith Friley, Lois Jean Perry from Chicago. I thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, not go through the whole list right now, but Vi Lilly and uh, many others. Uh, Barbara Allen from Longview, Texas. I thank you. Phyllis and Kevin Tony. Kevin died, but his wife Phyllis is alive, and I thank you. Uh, for your support. And David Snyder, who is one of the first people to call me on this program and to ask for prayer for 
refugees, uh, clergy, Syrian clergy, and he's from Texas. And Brother Snyder, I want you to know I have not forgotten you. Uh, there are several other names, uh, Lois Jean Perry, I don't know if I mentioned her from Chicago. My potty train partner, <laughs> Margie Shorter, and her husband Joe from, I know that sounds weird, but in New Orleans, but uh, it's funny. Some of the people I was potty trained with, Reverend, uh, I still keep in touch with. Oh, and I was born in New Orleans, I don't know if you know that, oh, but uh, it, it's kind of funny that those relationships were built when we were much younger. Folk, uh, we're about out of time, but uh, thank you so much for watching this program. Next week, I'm coming back for one more episode about Elijah. And this episode, also from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings, is where Elijah is listening to hear the voice, the direction of God. And uh, so it's something you won't want to miss. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us today. God bless, God keep you. Uh, and Reverend Rogers, thank you thank for you. being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for watching today's program. We hope you've been blessed in a powerful way. Just knowing you took the time to watch today's broadcast is a great encouragement to Pastor Nick Hood. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, we ask that you mail a tax-free donation to Nicholas Hood Ministries at 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan, 48201. And the point that I'm making is that in everybody's life, at some point, there's a plan B. God is talking to us every step of the way. God is trying to show you something every step of the way. When things seem to be going wrong, that's God's way of, of opening another door. I am convinced that God has been directing me every step of my life. On the Word Network. You know why I really love uh, Nick Hood as a minister? I watched his father uh, do it, and he took over for the church. And uh, he was one of us, but he really turned out to be a great minister. I know it's hard, and that's something that I know that all ministers may not be doing what they're doing because uh, for the right reasons. But I know it's hard. I know he's a beautiful man, and we've been knowing each other for over 50 years. Uh, I believe in him. He's inspired me in so many ways to do what I'm doing and try to be the best at it. Make sure you watch Nick Hood's ministries. You'll never be the same.